had a, um, like an opening, the PMO, for PMO um, Sydney Meetup uh, is there because of its um, sponsors and the supporters. Uh, PMO Solutions, uh, PMI Sydney Chapter, Express 360 and EPM Partners and PMO Group. Um, before we start, um, who, wherever you go, please shut up the space and watch the webinar. Um, I hope that uh, the quality of the... Yes. Okay, are you talking? No. Just listening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. The participants are the only audience. Um, so you guys have, um, sorry, the, you can in, interact with the host and the panelists through the text chat. That, uh, you can see it uh, easily. And then current session is live in PMO Solutions YouTube. Uh, sorry, guys, I have to stop. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so we have Fatima today. Okay. Fatima is an amazing friend of mine. We, have, we met each other in different conferences. Um, a great coach, a very, very amazing lady. Um, the CEO and the founder of Agile and Management Office. Uh, one of the key things that they deliver in uh, joint management assistance. Fatima, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong um, along the way. Uh, they provide governance solutions for organizations to manage and govern projects in the agile area. Um, very successful businesswoman. Um, um, and also, Fatima is one of the top three finalists in the World PMO Global Award as uh, an influencer. Uh, she's her passion, uh, seeing her successfully transform how business sovereign change across portfolios up to 1 billion and over 16 industries globally. Fantastic. Um, and she proves that AMO method is showing how business can not only align but enhance the job delivery methodologies with robust governance. I agree with you. Fatima is also a speaker and host of the Agile Idea podcast. Uh, I'm myself one of the listeners uh, for of the podcast. They're great. Um, also in the different magazines, different, um, oh, featured on CIO.com. And also um, Fatima has to talk in different um, events and conferences globally. One of the great things that Fatima has done is uh, she's a guest lecturer in our Aros University in Denmark. Um, and um, as far as I know, the team in AMO um, helped the university to create a new program for their project management courses. Um, and also, one of the great things that Fatima does is supporting the community with anxiety and depression through Beyond Blue and having spoken at 45 events aimed at raising awareness and reducing stigma and encouraging other systems get involved. So, um, the sponsors of uh, our events in PMO Sydney is about PMO Solutions, the only and prime PMO Global Alliance in Australia. Um, you have PMO Solutions Framework, which gives you um, uh, how to integrate um, your, how to create the integrated solution, and also providing PMO valuing uh, that platform to manage the PMO also. We have PMO CP as a PMO Practitioner Certification and different training courses, which I invite you to look at our website to learn more about them. The other main sponsor of this event is uh, PMI Sydney Chapter, uh, which I encourage you to have a look at the events. I'm sure, I, I, I'm sure they have uh, another event coming soon. Um, and um, they have locally in uh, Australia, in especially Sydney, more than 1,750 members. And they offer um, their members 
events, training courses, development courses, mentoring program, and networking opportunity. All right, so now I am going to stop my sharing and pass it to Fatima to start her amazing presentation. Hello, Karen. Uh, okay, are you on the presenter? Awesome. I'll just share my screen. Thank you so much, um, Amira, for that very generous introduction. And uh, also, thank you for uh, everybody joining. I know it's the it's the end of the day, and uh, there's obviously probably been a busy day. It's midway through the week, so hump day. So hopefully you get a lot of value. Um, hope you've got your pens and pads ready because there'll be a lot of content. I'm a very detailed person, so I like to share a lot, probably more so than uh, maybe you might be used to. So we'll, we'll go through quite a lot of things. And as Amira said, if you've got questions, feel free to share them in the chat box. Um, before we get started, I just want to say that I hope you're having a good day. And if you are not, please know that there is help out there. So I'm not going to go through any more of this because we've kind of covered it. Um, so let's get straight into it. So my promise to you today is I'm going to go through what digital transformation means for us as PMO, uh, insights around synergizing governance, evolving capabilities, and how we bring it together in creative ways. So I'm going to share some tips and guidance, um, and hopefully you'll get some good value that you can then go and apply tomorrow in your, in your roles and in your um, opportunity. Uh, within the organisations you're working for. Hopefully you can get involved, ask questions throughout, um, and I would love a fee uh, some feedback at the end if you did find it helpful or if there's anything we can improve going forward. So let's start with what is digital transformation? So I wanted to, I wanted to just really emphasise what it is, not from the perspective of being um, by any means an expert on digital transformation, but just to kind of highlight, because I know um, going back several years, I wasn't really clear what it was. And so it took some time for myself to learn and understand a little bit more about it. Depending on the company that you work with, the person that you talk to, websites you may look at, there's several different definitions and interpretations for digital transformation. So I've sort of just pulled out one that I believe fits um, the digital transformation message um, and emphasises on what we're going to cover off today. There's no denying that 90 99% of organisations are, di are digital in some way, shape or form and, and all of them have different elements of digital whether they realise they are transforming down that path or not. And we'll go through a few examples as well. As a small business, when the global pandemic hit, thankfully we were prepared to work online using digital tools and technology to work from home almost instantly, whereas unfortunately not many companies um, were completely prepared and so there were some challenges for them and I think now digital transformation more than ever is getting a lot more limelight. So it's a really good opportunity for PMOs. But I will say there is no right or wrong when it comes to digital transformation. So when asking what digital transformation um, is and, and how it applies, you know, some of the, the, the points that I've listed here are things that people have said to me. Um, you know, it's completely IT related or it's all about agile or maybe it's to do with creating websites. So this is something that you know, really uh, are part and parcel relevant to what we're going to talk about. But ultimately, when you think about digital and transformation, these are some of the, the areas that we need to look at. These are not exhaustive, but some of the technology being considered as part of many digital transformations. Um, and what all of these have in common is ultimately they start and they end with the customer. It's interesting, as, as a recent judge at the Global PMO Awards, I've actually been fortunate to see a number of PMOs that have actually utilised things like artificial intelligence to, um, to basically get a pulse check using their portfolio project management tools on how when project managers are submitting their status reports, for example, using artificial intelligence and different sentiment analysis to actually see what response and whether, whether they were you know, in, a, in a happy mood or whether they were sad or and just different sorts of things that they're doing, which is quite interesting, um, to be honest. People often assume that digital transformation is all about IT, but regardless of the fact that IT would have a big part to play in it, it really is an organisational-wide um, approach. And it's something that 
business transformation itself supported by investments in technology. It's not technology in search of opportunities. So we'll cover off a little bit more specifics for PMO. So key pillars of digital transformations, each of these need to be in sync for transformation to be successful. Everything from the customer experience, that's providing a consistent journey and personalised experience from the start of a customer entering the door right through to the end. The same applies when we think about PMO, be it our customers, be it project managers, executives, steering committees, whoever it might be, all the way through to the, the processes that we use, the technology solutions that we have in place, how they how they operate, and also how that aligns back to strategy, which is where the business model comes into it. So ultimately, we need to think about all of these as part of the way that we look at things moving forward. Governance is at the heart of everything that we do, and it's a core part of PMO. So we need to think about how governance plays a factor in all of these pillars, and it really, really does. And I'll talk to you about some examples um, as we move forward. I'm curious to know, um, for everyone on the call, is your organisation currently undertaking a digital transformation? Um, I, I'm interested to know, um, yes or no, how many of you are actually seeing that at the moment? Or maybe now you're realising that's what's happening based on sort of some of the insights that I've just shared. So, um, yeah, feel free to share your comments in there. Perfect, yes, yes. It's interesting because I think I'd be surprised surprised if, if there wasn't an organisation that wasn't. I really would be, but we move on. So I know you've probably seen this example and I'm going to bring it up because it's a good one. And I think that it may be obvious to many about examples where digital transformation maybe has gone wrong. For those of you that are not familiar, this is the last blockbuster store in Oregon, USA. And again, for those that may be not familiar, it's an American-based provider of home movie and video game rentals. They themselves had the monopoly um, on this space. At its peak in 2004, Blockbuster employed almost 85,000 people worldwide, and they had uh, over 9,000 stores um, globally, with more than half in the US. Unfortunately, though, they didn't do a good job in transforming and moving towards a digital way of working. And, and there's many reasons for that. So I'll go into that in a minute. When you look at the other side of it, what's an organisation that's absolutely smashing it when it comes to digital transformation and doing it right? Well, Netflix, that is. And I'm fairly sure that most of you would be familiar with Netflix. In 2018, it made over $15 billion in revenue. And for those who don't know, Netflix uh, was trying to be acquired by Blockbuster for about $50 million um, in, in the year 2000. Unfortunately, Blockbuster declined that offer. And as you can see, one of them has significantly grown as a result of identifying the need to evolve the way that we watch movies and took the initiative to actually make it possible. It's one thing to want to transform, and it's another thing to be, be able to execute us. So when we look at these two and we compare them side by side, we look at one who effectively refused to change their business model. They were delusional in thinking that they were too big to fail and didn't really believe that much in terms of technology and what, what that could mean for their business. So ultimately, they believed in their business plan, the plan that had brought them millions and millions of dollars and, worth, and millions worth of success in the past. They thought that their advantage was in their marketing and, and the fact that they were the largest video rental company in the United States. But then when you look at sort of the Netflix side of it, there was a completely different success that came from them taking a, a sort of a stab at a different business model and doing things very differently. Now, despite many attempts for Blockbuster to try to go down that Netflix path, um, unfortunately, that didn't succeed very well. And this is just two examples. There's other examples with, you know, companies like GE and Ford, all of them of which may be biting off more than they can chew or trying to transform their business model. But unfortunately, for example, with Ford, trying to, to move towards a more digital way of working with some areas within their business, they didn't actually integrate that across the organisation and also had challenges themselves. So there's a lot of different things to consider. These are just some really big examples. So when asked the question, 
What does digital transformation mean for PMOs? It means opportunity and challenges. Many people think that PMOs, along with other more traditional support functions, whether you call yourself a project support office, an enterprise PMO program office, whatever you want to call it, a lot of people uh, make the assumption that, that PMOs are going to actually disappear as digital transformation takes hold. I've even heard people say that robots are going to take over our, our roles. I've actually heard that people believe that the PPM, Portfolio Project Management Tools, are going to take over the PMO's role, which people um, don't realise is that the PMO is, is all about people. It's, a, it's about communications and stakeholder management and relationships. It's not just about technology. Technology is an enabler for us. So at the moment, as digital transformation takes hold and many companies, um, you know, all, all of the big four banks at the moment, I believe, are running a really large digital transformation program and seems to be going on forever. Ultimately, I think that this is an opportunity for PMOs not only to become leaner in the way that they work so they can keep up with the agility and the flexibility that's needed for digital transformation, but it also means that things are getting interesting. It means that our roles have a very big potential to become a lot more value-add. Now, there's going to be different sentiments in different companies depending on their experiences with PMOs, but ultimately it's a really big opportunity. Because when you think about it, PMOs are not only going to be recipients of the digital transformation changes, but also a promoter of that change. Whether you're a PMO that's at a practitioner level within a project, or whether you're the enterprise PMO reporting into a CEO, ultimately, PMOs themselves today have a really big opportunity and are uniquely positioned within the organisation to act as a catalyst for this change and actually help, uh, help the organisation with their transformation journey, but also benefit from digitalisation themselves. I'm sure many of you probably have experienced outdated tools or inefficient tools, or maybe you've been involved in trying to secure new project portfolio management tools. At the moment, the demand for that is quite, um, quite high. Every uh, sort of second week, there's sort of calls or requests of people reaching out purely because of PMO in the title asking to present their product or put a solution. They wouldn't invest the millions of dollars that they're spending in these tools if they weren't beneficial and in demand. So just have a think about that as well. Ultimately, PMOs have the opportunity to be custodians of the change and also be custodians of the digital tools, the platform, the processes, and helping the project. Um, ultimately, PMOs ourselves are actually there. We've got a really big opportunity at the moment. I'm interested to know, before I go into some examples, what do you see as the biggest challenge for PMOs in digital transformation? If you could just share an example um, in the chat, I would be really interested to know if you are in the middle of an organisation who's going through digital transformation, what you've seen, and if you um, haven't, what you would expect might be a challenge. Um, if you wanted to share your thoughts on that, I'd be, yeah, be interested to know um, what that might be. So feel free to put some comments in the chat box. Just resource knowledge and skills, yep, that's definitely one of them. 100% interesting, it's definitely re relevant to the next slide. How to be more agile and focus on value delivery, not processes and practice. Absolutely spot on, yes, 100%. That's great we'll talk about that as well. Sorry? I'm saying that's a great point. 100%, yeah, 100%. And we'll talk about that as well. So let me show you a few of the few of the challenges. Not exhaustive. Um, these are practical challenges that I've actually seen firsthand um, and in some way, shape or form experienced. The key challenges when it comes to adopting a digital type of PMO is things like data integrity. It's about the, the, the um, user access management and management of uh, access, accessibility to different tools, whether it be PPMs, etc. It's also integration. As we continue to bring in more and more tools, and I'm not saying we as in the PMO are bringing the tools, but the organisations we're working within, there's a lot more oversight and management, particularly when those tools touch any part um, of the things that we're involved in, whether we're involved in the projects that link back to the customers or whether we're talking about internal initiatives where they're transforming the tools that we use day to day. And we've seen that with 
Office 365 and Teams and Skype and you know, Zoom and all of these different things that are being introduced. So we really need to think about um, and, and help the organisations by putting in place those careful thinking and that, and that planning that PMOs are really good at in light of some of these challenges. You know, one of the other ones, a big one at the moment, working with um, one of Australia's uh, biggest banks, legacy problems with their, like, you know, 50, 100, 200-year-old uh, legacy processes and, and the, 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 the amount of stuff that they've got to go through to actually be able to transform is huge. Large business, lots and lots of challenges, and they're facing these and then some. The other one that was mentioned is skills. Now, it's a really important one for me because I, in, in the global white paper that I released at the end of last year, one of the seven global challenges for PMOs based on the research and the conversations with practitioners like yourself was the fact that PMOs are expected to do everything and then some and just know how to do it. Think about a digital transformation program. If you've been involved in one, they hire digital project managers, digital BAs. They, they just happen to find people with specific digital type skill sets. That's, you know, lean and innovation and digital and, and, and other skills like that. But when they go out to find pre-MO people that are going to support these programs, they just look for PMO people. Um, they just expect that the people they have or the people they're going to find are going to have those skill sets. Now, don't get me wrong, some people probably may have those skills. But let's be honest, as Agile's increased in popularity over the last five years, I can tell you for a fact that most conversations I have with people around PMO is, holy crap, what are we going to do? How do we be more agile? Because our projects are telling us they don't need us. And I can tell you firsthand that two of the big four banks specifically who said there was no need for PMOs are starting to recruit them again right now. So it's really interesting where people make assumptions that it's not needed, but there is opportunity if you take them and use them right. The key, challenge, key challenges, as I said, uh, are... Um, around data and digital skills, but the other one as well is collection of data um, and how we utilise that data. The addition to that as well is the adaptability and speed. A lot of digital transformations is happening using agile and lean type processes. And so those types of methods and approaches that are being used are not a good fit for the traditional governance, the traditional PMO way of working that we're used to seeing. Um, and so we'll cover some of that as well. Let's look at some opportunities. So now when we look at opportunities, I'm interested to, um, to share some of these because I think when we think about opportunities, they far outweigh the challenges. Personally, based on my research and based on the conversation, they far outweigh. Why? Because with greater digital project-related systems and good execution of them, it means better data, for our customers, being our PMs or our, our um, executives or our CEOs, etc., It also means that you're going to be able to provide your stakeholders information anytime on any device and enable them to use that information to drive continuous improvement further. It also means that you get an opportunity to get involved in utilising new technologies that maybe you would not have had the opportunity to do before. It will also enable you to work in different ways. There's a lot of digital transformation happening um, in the offices prior to COVID where we actually see digital transformation areas blocked off in some of the companies and everybody works together really, really, um, really, really in, a new, in this new style of working where they're all together and they're working a lot more collaboratively, maybe more so than what I've seen on large programs before where they've tried to transform. And so there's a real good opportunity here where as you improve and simplify your processes, you'll be able to release capacity. If you think about any, I'll give you an example. Um, in one of the banks previously, I remember picking up a function and in that function they were contributing uh, work for 40 project status reports. Project level, enterprise level, internal, external, all sorts of reports. When we reduce those 40 reports to five per month as opposed to 40, it freed up resource capacity. And what do you think we did? We utilised that capacity to invest in innovative things that then helped us to have the most successful program. And that was one part of many things that we 
did as a result of creating um, more innovative ways of working. So ultimately, I think that the actual, the actual uh, opportunities are, are endless. So think about these and have these in your mind as we move forward to the, to the next step. So synergizing governance. I did say that I wanted to talk to you about that. Now, some people will say that anything to do with PMR and governance is purely related to project delivery. And that's okay. There is a lot of PMOs that only focus on project delivery governance, which is project management, program management, anything to do with project delivery. But when we think about uh, project delivery, I'm talking about departmental guidelines. I'm talking about you know, financial resource management, financial support, tool management, document management, um, all of those sorts of things. The other element that also sometimes comes up is enterprise governance. Now, for those who've worked in enterprise PMOs, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is things such as alignment to strategy, investment management, alignment to new internal policies or maybe internal audit support. These are the sorts of things that you think about. Benefits management at a strategic level. One of the areas that I don't see frequently discussed, which I do stress is important, is external governance. Again, this is an opportunity for PMOs. This is around industry regulations, um, particularly with the, with the Global Financial, uh, sorry, the uh, Royal Commission and the financial crisis and all of those sorts of events. They involve a lot of external regulations and external compliance needs and whatnot. So this is where external governance comes in. It's about vendor management. It's about interdependencies with third parties. It's about ex external audit support that might come in. You might have a consulting company come in and they, they need you to help support their audit that they're you know, doing, whatever it might be. But ultimately, I think those three things together is what's going to make the PMO successful long term. It's going to help set them apart. It doesn't matter if you are in a program PMO or a project PMO or you are in the EPMO, you've still got an opportunity to be involved and have visibility across these areas. Because remember, governance doesn't start and stop with delivery. It's something that covers everything from right from strategic, uh, the strategic definition of what the investment slate is going to look like, right through to we're handing over to BAU and they've got to manage the benefits long term. So there's a whole element of governance that sometimes I think is forgotten. So we want to make sure that our governance frameworks, our PMO frameworks, are absolutely going to be supporting this. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, where do you fit in amongst this? Now, obviously, as I mentioned, not everybody is going to be in the position to help really drive the needle and make decisions. Um, if you are a decision maker, perhaps you are sitting in an enterprise PMO, perhaps you are in a medium sized business and you have the ability to influence and make um, make big impacts. Uh, if you're not a decision maker, you might be an influencer who may be working at a department level and maybe you are connected with the organisation in, in um, you know, PMO guilds or sort of other functions and you guys can connect and talk to each other and you might be able to influence things that way. And then ultimately you might be a, re a recipient and also a contributor. A contributor might be someone working day to day in a project, but ultimately you all have not only a part to play, but a significant opportunity to, to drive innovation, to drive change, to drive agility. You know, think about the fact that when we look at the decision makers, they might sit higher up in an organisation and can drive the change, but it's the people that are at the working level that are in the day-to-day -day trenches, such as the contributors, who have the opportunity to really help drive change that's going to be beneficial for the company. And so I need, think we need to think about all of the elements that are going to help you, regardless of whether you're a decision maker, an influencer, or a contributor. I'm curious to know, are you a decision maker, an influencer, or a contributor? Are you A, B, or C in your company today? How many people have we got that are A, B, or C? You can just add in the chat box, I'm curious to know. Decision make. Okay, A and B. Yep, that's absolutely possibly. You may, you may in fact be. Yeah, multiple. Yep. B and C. Yep. B. 
B and a bit of A. Perfect. Okay. And look, there's no right or wrong answer. It's absolutely um, every single role is important. And so don't think that you have to be the decision maker to make change. I promise you that's not the case. You just have to have stakeholders around you that are willing to listen. And sometimes you'll get companies that are open to listening and others that may not. So just have that in, have that in our mind. But I'll give you some some um, tips and strategies that I think you can apply and that you'll be able to learn from regardless of whether you're a decision maker or a contributor. And that's what's so amazing about the PMO world and the things that you learn about it is that you've got the opportunity of actually making, making impact, whether you're improving one single process or whether you're making some drastic change. Either way, you have an opportunity to do that. So now, how do we evolve our capabilities? This is the, the part where we talk about what are the things that we can do and what are the things we can change or what are the things that we can evolve. But first and foremost, what is a capability? Now, I can tell you early on my career, I didn't know what a capability was. I just thought that it was a judgmental way of assuming whether or not I had the right skills to do something. But it's not. Capabilities themselves are often misunderstood because the concept of capabilities can mean both the abilities of an individual but also the capabilities at an organisational level. So not only at the individual level but at an organisational level. Now we've been building a capability management model for our business and I can tell you that prior to doing this exercise which has been going for the last three or four months, it was really not clear how to differentiate between the capabilities at an individual level versus organisational level. But it's really important. And when you bring together the people, the resources, the technology, and, and bring these together in, in a consistent way, in a way that's going to work, it's going to, it makes magic things happen. I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it at the moment um, in what we're doing, or what we're trying to do. But one of the things I will say, when we think about capabilities, Remember, capabilities is not the how, it's the what. A process is the how we do something, the capability is the what we do. For example, a capability might be financial management. Um, and you might have that capability in your team, in your PMO, in your company, etc. The processes that you would create are the how. So just wanted to differentiate that. So with capabilities, the what of a business, they can change, they can vary by industry, I, I guarantee you no two businesses will have the same capability. For example, in a mining company, they have a capability to dig up gold, whereas in a utilities company, they probably um, would have different capabilities that relate to providing power. And so every business is different, and so capabilities should be um, also different. When you review your capabilities, be it an individual or at an organisational level where you'll be part of that value chain, it can inspire all around improvement because capabilities themselves and what you guys are all guys and girls are doing today on the call is looking at uplifting your capability and and learning something because I, I truly believe that you spend your whole life learning um, it's it's constant learning it's not about um, you know I, I when I was younger my, my manager said I said oh, I'm so concerned I you know I've only got a couple of years experience how am I ever gonna get you know, further in, in Korea. And he's like, Fatima, he goes, most people you see that have 20 years experience, it's actually a year of experience and um, 19 years of practice. And I just thought that was quite clever. So not to discount someone with 20 years experience, but just to say that, you know, if, if, if you are always learning, you're, you're going to eventually um, continue to grow and that will help the organisation because the individual uplifts the organisation as well. So in doing some research, I came across the six digital age skills for project delivery. Now, this came from the PMI Pulse of the Profession, which you're probably all familiar with, I hope. And it was really interesting because there's some good ones here that I think are relevant. These were specific to project delivery. So as usual, a lot of the PMI um, sort of stuff that I've referenced in their white paper and other forms is a lot of the time about project management. Why? Because project management is, I believe, further ahead than PMO for many reasons. You can read the white paper to learn about that. But when I thought about PMO, what were the digital age skills equivalent for PMO, I really wanted to um, call out these specific ones. These five that I think really 
are going to help us um, to make the changes necessary and to ensure that we've, we've got the right skills to keep up with project, um, project management. So knowing these things, it's about how do we uplift our skills and by doing so, we then in turn uplift our capabilities. So have these in your mind and these are the skills that I really believe are going to help you from a digital transformation perspective. Now, I'm curious to know if any of you have heard of the bridge on River Choloteca. Um, if you have, bear with me. If you haven't, I'm going to just tell you a quick story. I only heard about this really recently. Um, it's a 484 metre long bridge over the River Choloteca, I think it's pronounced, in Honduras, in Central America. It's a region that is notorious for storms and hurricanes. And it's Interesting because when they decided to build the new bridge over the river Choloteca in 1996, they wanted to ensure that it would withstand the extreme weather conditions they have in that region. So they contracted a Japanese firm and they built the solid bridge and they designed it to withstand powerful forces and all of the things that would happen in that region. And it was amazing. It opened in 1998, a couple of years later, and it was absolutely the pride and joy of, Chol of uh, Honduras. In October that year, Hurricane Mitch hit Honduras. And as a result, there was 75 inches of rain. Now to give you an example and put that into perspective, that's six months worth of rain for Honduras. That happened in four days. The river swelled, flooded the region. Unfortunately, 7,000 lives were lost. Every single bridge in Honduras was destroyed, except for this one. And the problem was, that even though this bridge, as you can see, is still intact, all the roads leading to and from the bridge were swept away. In fact, the river, the hurricane actually caused the river to change course. And as you can see, the bridge is now no longer across the river. It's, it's a bridge to nowhere. It's a bridge to nothing. Why do I think this story is relevant? Because the world is changing. Our organisations are changing. Technology is changing. The way we deliver is changing. And so we as PMO need to adapt to change quickly or we end up becoming obsolete. And I can tell you that in some organisations, they are dissolving their PMOs. I, I surveyed some CIOs late last year and almost 45% said they were dissolving their PMOs. They didn't believe they were necessary. And so that's just one example of many, I'm sure. So we need to not spend all of our time trying to solve every little problem and forget that the problem that we're trying to solve might actually change as did happen with this river. So we need to remember that the frameworks, the processes, the tools, the methods, the approach, the relation, everything you do needs to be built to adapt, not built to last. And I ref refer to this as applicable to digital transformation, but even the transformation opportunities in the PMO. So use this as a guide um, in future. So bringing it together onto the good stuff, onto the, some of the uh, practical stuff that you can take away, hopefully, and leverage. So number one, transforming purposes. So this is about understanding. Now, you may not be the decision maker in why you're transforming, why you're moving to digital, or what you're going to be doing going forward but you should understand it. If you are in any way, shape or form going to contribute efficiently and successfully to a transformation, you really need to understand. It's like being a project manager and running a project and having no idea what the scope is. It just doesn't make sense. So here it's about understanding why you want to change or why the organisation wants to change rather What's their, you know, approach going forward? What's their business model? You know, going back to those four pillars, the business model. What's the consumer requirements they're trying to appease? What's the technology that they're looking at? Growing, uh, looking at the purpose, growing a business. Is it automation? Is it sustainability? Whatever it might be, whatever the purpose is, just think about that um, and understand that. And that would really help you because then you can build your PMO or improve or modify or change or pivot based on that. Now, I'm not saying it's a direct link one-to-one -to, -one to a strategy, but at least if you know where they're going, you can make some recommendations. Um, nothing's worse than when you see 
an organisation going on a digital transformation and they go and introduce a new tool or a process or whatever it might be, only to find that what they've introduced doesn't work. Um, one of the organisations I worked with a few years ago introduced a new project portfolio management tool. They did this with the intent of streamlining and automating and improving data management on projects and blah, blah, blah. What they didn't do is they didn't actually understand the real purpose of the tool. They didn't include anyone that practically used it day to day. They involved project managers, but did they involve the governance people, the gatekeepers, the checkpoint people? No, they didn't. <coughs> and what ended up happening is they introduced it when now it's not actually going to tick the boxes they thought it was going to tick because when they started training with the PMOs, and I'm talking about a large company that has hundreds of PMOs, they actually realised that it's actually not going to address the day-to-day -day things that, you know, process that could be automated and whatnot. So you've got to understand the purpose and the strategy and hopefully then you can provide some input to that. Planning for capability uplift, we've just touched on that. So this is where you're not going to get the budget that you wish that you're going to get. It's one of the big gaps for PMOs globally. Often they don't have budgets to uplift their capability. They don't get trained budgets. You're lucky if you're a permanent employee, you might get some. As a contractor, I've never, ever seen it. Um, probably actually once I can remember where I was offered some training. Other than the boring uh, compliance stuff that you have to do when you start in a new role. So you really need to take the initiative to find um, your own way to not only identify the capabilities you need for yourself, but if you think of your PMO as your organisation, um, how, how, what are the capabilities that you need and what are the things that you need to do to uplift, then prioritise and then put a plan around uplifting them. So you can't resolve everything, but think about it from an agile way. You have a big list of things you want to address. Think about the things that are absolute must-haves. Right now, one of the capabilities you need is that agility. So prioritising agile skills. I'm not talking about SAFE or Scrum or Kanban. I'm talking about agile in general. And then whichever methodology or approach that your organisation chooses, then obviously being aware of that as well. So just thinking about that and taking the opportunity to uh, understand that. Applying a situational governance lens. I talk about situational governance lens as I'm referring to the front door from the idea being identified, prioritised, through to handing over back to BAU. That entire value chain there is not a straight line and there's many assumptions being made, but you need to be able to constantly reset and modify your governance approach to suit the changing requirements around you. We may not always be able to control what we, um, what, what initiatives are going to come through or how investment slates are prioritised or what initiative, uh, what project managed budgets you get. We may not be involved in that unless we're decision makers. But you still can make sure that from the front of the initiative through to completion that the governance is synchronised. Um, and we'll, I'll cover a bit more of that in a, a, a further point. Agreeing the delivery methods. So, if you are involved in determining what project management delivery methods is going to be used, great, because you have a say in that, but often we don't. We just have to work with whatever the PMs want to use, and that may be a consistent approach that's dis discovered and defined by a CIO or by a head of or whatever it might be. And that's okay. What you need to ensure you're doing is making sure that once you know what the delivery method is going to be, that you integrate your governance at different points. Think of checkpoints, think of, um, you know, some people call them gates. Uh, think about how you understand what the budgets are at the beginning of a, a project versus throughout the project, what do you need to know when the project's in operations and it's running. Just understanding what are the integration points and thinking about creating a methodology that is, I'm sorry, a methodology agnostic governance approach that is going to support regardless of the fact that project managers change their mind frequently, and I've seen them go from Prince 2 to Pinbox to Agile in you know, the space of two years. So don't make your PMO method dependent on a project management methodology because it's a project management methodology, not a PMO methodology. Activate operational relationships is where I was um, 
mentioning just a couple of slides ago, where it's about making sure that those integration points in project land are, are in place, but also making sure that the partnerships you need to be successful with HR, with finance, with audit, with uh, the risk people, wherever it is that are other departments, that they themselves are also um, activated, that you, you know who they are, how they can help and how they link into what you do. Many times PMOs create sort of like a little mini uh, world around them in a bubble and don't realise that to recruit, we need to talk to HR. To pay invoices, we've got to work with procurement. To get reports on timesheets, we need to get access to the accounts team and the general ledger. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. We need to make sure we activate these. You activate the relationships, it streamlines everything for you. Introducing continuous improvement, because again, when we adapt, we grow, we grow, we learn. So this is around making sure you've got a way to seek and con accept constructive feedback. As I mentioned at the start, I'm going to ask people to do a one minute survey to give me some feedback. Without continuous improvement, then we're standing still. So make sure you have a process and an approach for that. And then effective process before automation. Too many companies are trying to automate stuff and they've got no idea what their processes are. Remember I said capabilities is the what and I said process is the how. You need both of those to be in sync and aligned to your strategy. And then you look at automation. People think that when they don't, sorry, executives often think when they don't have access to the right data or right information, it's because they don't have a project portfolio management tool and they need that instantly. That's not correct. That just exasperates your problem, particularly when you don't do enough due diligence and bring in the right tool. It can actually set you back and cost you a lot of money. As I mentioned, the earlier example, it ended up costing the organisation over a million dollars in 12 months because they didn't set it up right to begin with. And then building a positive mindset. So you've probably heard mindset 100,000 times, particularly lately with culture conversations and agile, but ultimately without that open mindset, the op being open to change, being open to experiment, being open to the feedback loops, being open to working as one, then you will not be successful. And this is why we stress that you need continuous collaboration across the internal silos of your organisation and your customers, whether they're internal customers or whether you're in retail and maybe your customers are the ones working into the supermarket. I can tell you that recent projects with the supermarket, second biggest supermarket in Australia, really opened our eyes, my team's eyes, to what you need to know when you think about your customers. And it's so different when you really look at your customers and you see them in the stores. So building your positive mindset is going to be absolutely critical and essential for you moving forward. In summary, everything around us is changing. The PMO has the, best, the biggest and best opportunity right now to provide reliability. It has the ability, absolutely, the ability to not only be that constant, be that, uh, that, that sort of the voice of reason, if you like, not as an individual, but as a team, but also enables you to take enterprise governance, external governance, project governance, take those requirements and translate them into language that makes sense and then help to implement them. You know, PMOs themselves need to input into digital transformation strategy and provide guidance and provide thoughts and provide insight into it. And so you've got a real big opportunity right now as to whether or not you want to get involved and what you're going to do about it. Digital transformation itself is going to provide greater accessibility. It's going to provide you greater reach across an organisation, a like a ton of learnings. And if you get involved in some really good juicy digital programs, you're going to learn agile skills that you probably wouldn't learn just from um, you know, reading books or just doing a course, you're practically applying them. So when the world around us is constantly changing, you've got an opportunity now to decide if you're going to survive or thrive um, and, you know, think of Blockbuster and Netflix as one example of that. So just quickly to just, um, just before we go to questions and I hand back to Amira, um, we are about to launch our first ever Agile in the PMO workshop. 
which we are going to help bring to light a lot of the things I've discussed today and also share in more detail some practical application of some techniques and talking through the different things that you need to know. And there is a specific um, opportunity for those who are today by using the code on your screen to get 50% off the workshop. The date's not being set, but it's expected to be late November. And I will share the link with Amira after the session. She can share it. If you want to register your interest, we can reach out to you and let you know dates and talk about the specifics. But if you mention today's um, code and provide feedback, you can have 50% off because it will be our first one that we're hosting. Um, other than that, thank you. And I will pass to um, Amira. Thank you so much, Fatima. It was awesome. Um, we Very have fun. now a question from Adrian, which is, I work in a small size bank and we are trying to go through a transformation. What do you think is important to do to bridge the gap between natively non-digital PMOs to have the most effectiveness in these digital transformations? So very good question and very common. Um, I think that you've already been thinking about, the fact that you've already been thinking about that is fantastic. Um, one of the things that I would recommend you do, and I've seen this work quite well, is bring, try to, if you can, bring all of those people together. Bring all of the people that are actually within those um, other PMOs together uh, as an opportunity to start thinking about what are the things that they are doing that you can continue doing and what are the things that you're trying to do that maybe that the old traditional way of working is holding them back. So you really need to get try to get them on site and help them understand that some of the things that you're trying to do are going to actually benefit them. Um, you could probably use and reference things like the capabilities that I've just mentioned as a way to help them realise that ultimately you are just part of the same company. And so you need them to understand what it is that you're trying to do and the only way you're going to do that is by helping them understand your purpose. I think bringing them together at a frequent um, monthly, for example, if, if you're, if you're um, smaller then you could probably do it fortnightly and just start working together. Maybe do a couple of experiments. I like to do a lot of experiments when I'm trying to test something new. We had to bring together in a mid-sized company, uh, financial services company, uh, five different PMO functions and they were all running differently. What we had to do is demonstrate to them what would be the benefit for them and we did that through incremental sessions and some think tanks and some um, workshops and whatnot. And it took, you know, a few months to get them on board but by the time they got there they were really grateful. So try some experiments of bringing them on board and hopefully that helps you out. Fantastic. Any other questions? I cannot see here and I don't see any question in the YouTube. All righty. Thank you so much, Fatima. I'm just getting uh, yeah. yeah. So thanks everybody. If there is a no question, we can move forward to the last part of the session, which is, oh, okay, yes. We have a survey. Um, I will send the survey to you all and it will be amazing if you guys can uh, fill the survey for us. And also we will appreciate your feedback in the meetup um, session. And for the last thing, I have, a book for you guys. So the book of the month, as always we uh, introduce a book at the end of the session, is Why Digital Transformation Fails. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this is the book of the month. I hope you guys enjoy the session and also enjoy your night and have the book, read it and let us know if there is any question. Please contact me or Fatima for the uh, workshop. Um, we will work together in terms of like sending you the information as well. Um, the session is recorded on YouTube as a live session um, and I will send a link to you guys if you want to go through it again. Thank you so much Fatima for accepting my invitation and for the time, amazing time that you put on together to uh, put all of these um, amazing information 
Um, You're very thank welcome. You all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you guys. Thanks. Bye bye. Cheers, Mel. Cheers, Bra, and cheers to Jose.